As his name indicates, the Malamut is native to Alaska. Early Eskimos who called themselves Inui, meaning the people, were nomads who relied on dogs and sleds to transport themselves and their goods through their snowy barren land. Besides pulling sleds or carrying burdens themselves, the dogs help hunters seek out polar bears and other food sources. These dogs, which are the ancestors of Alaskan Malamus, belong to the Spitz family of dogs which includes Akitas, Chow Chow, Siberian Husky, and many more breeds. Based on studies of the canine genome, the Alaskan Malamut is one of the most ancient breeds in existence. The relationship between the dogs and the people was a close one, with the dogs being well fed and cared for, and babies suckling on dogs along with puppies, both instances that can be pointed to as a basis for the Malamut's love of people. Malamutes became important in 1896 during the Alaska Gold Rush, when miners paid sky-high prices for sleds and dog teams. A good dog alone could cost up to $500, and a sled and a small team could run as much as $1,500. While the Malamute was popular, this was a dangerous time for the breed because many people crossed the Malamutes with other bees to either increase their speed or their size. Fortunately, the Swiss genes were dominant, and the Malamutes quickly reverted. The Afghan hound is from Afghanistan, but little is known of his early history or how long he's existed. A drawing of one of the dogs sent home by Thomas Stewart Broughton while he was in India in 1809 was published in a book of letters in 1813, so the breed has certainly been around for more than 200 years and likely very much longer. Studies of the canine genome indicate that the Afghan descended from one of the oldest types of dogs. The dogs in Afghanistan were found in several different times depending on the region they were from. Dogs from mountainous areas were more compact with darker, heavier coats, while desert dwelling dogs were more rangy with coats that were lighter in both color and volume. They were used to course fast running games such as deer and antelope, as well as hares, wolves, and jackals. Hunting in partnership with falcons, they flushed quail and partridges for the falcon to bring down or for the hunter to shoot. British military officers brought the dogs back to the west after being posted to the India-Afghanistan border and the dogs unfortunately died out in Europe during the World War I because food shortages limited the breeding and keeping of dogs. But breeding began again in 1920 when some desert time Afghans were imported to Scotland by people who had been stationed in Balochistan. Some of the mountain type dogs were sent from Kabul to England in 1925. During the same decade, Americans imported some of the Afghans from Britain. Alaskan Malamutes are friendly and love people. This makes them a wonderful choice for the active family that's got a thief alarm and doesn't need a Malamute for his watchdog abilities. That's because he doesn't have any. He's moderately vocal and will howl along with sirens or talk to you with expressive woo-woos. For a spitz breed though, he's pretty quiet and doesn't typically become a barker. This dog is smart and curious and he wants nothing more than to share his discoveries with his human family members. Discoveries like exactly how the sofa was put together or what the interior of your car would look like without all that carpeting. The good news is that destructiveness in a Malamute is preventable and treatable. The cure is exercise and lots of it, no matter what the weather is or if you have the flu. Lots and lots of strenuous exercise. Hiking, pulling sleds in winter and carts in summer, although don't let him become overheated, competitive weight pulling and formal obedience are all good outlets for his brain and his brawn. The Malamute is smart, learns quickly and loves you, but he's also strong-willed and independent. Before we continue, please consider hitting that like and subscribe button as it would mean a lot. Thanks. The Afghan hound is aloof and dignified except when he's being silly. Aloof doesn't mean shy. He should never be afraid of people and is usually not aggressive towards them. He takes his time getting to know people outside his family. People who are fortunate enough to be allowed into a circle of friends will experience a dog with an exuberant nature and a wicked sense of humor. Afghans do everything to extremes. They're drama queens and food thieves, bossy and mischievous. They have a high prey drive, and although they may get along well with cats they were raised with, outdoor cats should fear for their lives when the Afghan springs into action. The Afghan is an independent thinker and is happy to do what you ask as long as that's what he wanted to do anyways. He's highly intelligent and learns quickly, but he won't always respond to your commands or better yet, requests. 
He's thinking about it. Maybe he'll do it later or not. This can make him frustrating to train and even more frustrating to compete with. Afghans have done well in sports such as agility and lure coursing, but only when their people have extreme patience, a never-ending sense of humor, and a good command of positive reinforcement techniques to lure him into compliance. The sport in which the Afghan excels, of course, is the lure coursing. If you're able to let him participate in this activity, you'll be rewarded by the sight of his breeding and heritage in action. Any dog, no matter how nice, can develop obnoxious levels of barking, digging, counter surfing, and other undesirable behaviors if he is bored, untrained, or unsupervised. Any dog can be a trial to live with during adolescence. Start training your puppy the day you bring him home. Even at 8 weeks old, he's capable of soaking up everything you can teach him. Don't wait until he's 6 months old to begin training or you will have a more headstrong dog to deal with. If possible, get him into puppy kindergarten class by the time he's 10 to 12 weeks old and socialize, socialize, socialize. However, be aware that many puppy training classes require certain vaccines like kennel cough to be up to date and many veterinarians recommend limited exposure to other dogs in public places until puppy vaccines, including rabies, distemper, and parvirus have been completed. In Leo of formal training, you can begin training your puppy at home and socializing him amongst family and friends until the puppy vaccines are completed. Talk to the breeder, describe exactly what you're looking for in the dog, and ask for assistance in selecting a puppy. Breeders see the puppies daily and can make uncannily accurate recommendations once they know something about your lifestyle and personality. All dogs have the potential to develop genetic health problems, just as all people have the potential to inherit a particular disease. Run and don't walk from any breeder who does not offer a health guarantee on puppies, who tells you that the breed is 100% healthy and has no known problems, or who tells you that her puppies are isolated from the main part of the household for health reasons. A reputable breeder will be honest and open about health problems in the breed and the incidents with which they occur in their lines. The Malamute is a fairly healthy dog, but he's at risk for some genetic diseases, including hip dysplasia. This is a particularly devastating condition for an active running dog like the Malamute. Make sure your breeder provides you with written documentation from the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals or the University of Pennsylvania, certifying that a puppy's parents are free of hip dysplasia. They can also suffer from inherited polyneuropathy, neuropathy, for which there is no screening test. This is a nervous system disorder that causes chronic lack of coordination and weakness in the dogs. The Alaskan Malamute Club of America participates in the Canine Health Information Center, a health database. Before any individual Malamute can be issued a CHIC number, breeders must submit hip evaluations from the OFA and eye test results from the Canine Eye Registry Foundation. The OFA certification of thyroid health is optional. In Afghan hounds, health problems can include hip and elbow dysplasia, juvenile cataracts, and bleeding disorders such as von Willebrand disease. Ask the breeder to show evidence that both parents have been certified free of juvenile cataracts by a veterinarian and have a hip evaluation of excellent, good, or fair from the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals. For an Afghan to achieve CHIC certification, he must have Orthopedic Foundation for Animals OFA or PanHip certifications for hip, an OFA thyroid evaluation, and an eye clearance from the Canine Eye Registry Foundation. Breeders must agree to have all test results, positive or negative, published in the CHIC database. A dog need not receive good or even passing scores on the evaluations to obtain a CHIC number, so CHIC registration alone is not proof of soundness or absence of disease, but all test results are posted on the CHIC website and can be accessed by anyone who wants to check the health of a puppy's parents. A good breeder will be able to discuss the prevalence of all health problems in her dog's lines, those with and without genetic screening tests, and how puppy buyers make an informed decision about health risks to their dog. Don't fall for a dishonest breeder's sales pitch. If the breeder tells you she doesn't need to do those tests because she's never had any problem in her lines, her dogs have been vet checked, or any of the other excuses bad breeders have for skimping on the genetic testing for their dogs, walk away immediately. Careful breeders screen the breeding dogs for genetic diseases and breed only the healthiest and best looking specimens. But sometimes mother nature has other ideas and a puppy develops one of those diseases despite good breeding practices. Advances in veterinary medicine means that in most cases the dogs can still live a good life. If you're getting a puppy, ask the breeder about the ages of the dogs in their lines and what they died of. Remember that after you've taken a new puppy into your home, you have the power to protect him from one of the most common health problems in dogs, obesity. 
Keeping your dog in an appropriate weight is one of the easiest ways to extend his life. Make the most of your preventive abilities to help ensure a healthier dog for life. The Alaskan Malamutes has a thick, coarse double coat. It's not especially high maintenance, as you can brush it a couple of times a week to remove dead hair and distribute skin oils, but it sheds year-round and more heavily on a seasonal basis. A Malamutes owner's best friend after his dog is his vacuum cleaner. Twice a year, Malamutes blow their coats. Picture mountains of hair drifting all over the house and attaching itself to every surface. The rest of the year, the shedding is much less, so much so that you might be able to get away with vacuuming only twice a day instead of every 4 hours. If you can put up with that, the Malamute is a pretty easy care dog. Bathe him every few months or whenever he's dirty. He doesn't need any special trimming to maintain his distinctive look. The Afghan Hound has long, thick, silky hair with a fine texture. The coat does not need to be clipped or trimmed and the dog wears it in all its glory. The finishing touch is a top knot of long, silky hair. Grooming is an essential part of living with an Afghan Hound. Plan to brush and comb the Afghan Hound's thick, silky hair three times a week to prevent or remove mats and tangles and bathe them as needed. You may want to invest in a professional dog blow dryer if you bathe him frequently. The Afghan sheds moderately. The more often you brush him, the less hair you will have falling off the dog and onto your floors, furniture and clothing. The rest is basic care. Trim the nails as needed, usually once a month, and good dental hygiene is important. So brush the teeth frequently for good overall health and fresh breath. Check the ears weekly for dirt, redness, or a bad odor that can indicate an infection. If the ears look dirty, wipe them out with a cotton ball dampened with a gentle ear cleaner recommended by a veterinarian. It's best to introduce your dog to grooming at an early age so he will accept it gracefully. Alright guys. Which one do you think you'll get? Tell me down in the comments.